Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. I thought I would respond to patron emails. I have been having some time lately, and I've been powering through all of your emails, and it feels really good to get them crossed off the list. I've, I've reduced the uh, Word doc from something like 80 pages of questions from patrons and all the way down to 20 pages. I just have 20 pages left. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. This first email is from patron Leanna. Leanna writes, Hi, Kirk. I really appreciated your response regarding transphobic clients when we last corresponded, and I was hoping you might have some thoughts on an area in my work that I'm finding challenging. I have been working in a clinic for a few years and serving predominantly white, rural, Christian, low socioeconomic status clients. I repeatedly find myself working with clients who will present with beliefs and in some cases report experiences that are outliers in some way. Stuff like religious fervor, such as the belief in experiencing ghosts and reports of speaking in tongues and seeing others' auras and astral projection and experiencing a demon or a demonic uh, possession, etc. I also have contended with some folks with pretty far-out conspiracy theories, such as aliens and government cover-ups. If these things don't pose any sort of functional problem or emotional difficulty, they're probably a non-issue. But often they have some big emotions tied to some of these things. These are tough for me. I am wholehearted. I am a wholehearted believer in the scientific method, and my worldview doesn't include these things. But as a counselor, I practice awareness of my beliefs and try to keep an open mind about other people's worldviews, even if I can't wrap my head around it. That said, at a certain point, I also can't help but think, is this a delusion or some other form of psychosis? Am I doing my job if I don't spot signs of mental illness? How can I stay aligned and validating of my clients' worldviews while also assessing for something that might require treatment? What are your thoughts? How would you handle these situations? Did I and da da da? Okay, yeah, these are all good questions. It's a common issue for us, particularly in today's times, I'm guessing. And I've worked with a lot of clients in this way, and I've worked with a lot of supervisees on this very issue. It really depends on the goal and your role. Always come back to what's your role and what's the goal. If your role and the goal is to help them lower their anxiety and they are reading internet propaganda about the Illuminati and they are terrified that the Illuminati is going to get them, then it makes sense that you would have a, you know, some conversations with them about this and maybe even about their worldview and how that is affecting their anxiety because they're coming to you for help on their anxiety, and that's what they want you to do. And so that might mean confronting them on things like this. But before you confront them, you really want to come from a curious stance, a questioning, really open-minded, curious stance, not a knowing stance, not a top-down stance. Like, like you might ask the client, is it helpful to be thinking about that stuff? Does, is, is that helping your anxiety to be looking at those websites? Are there other possible explanations that that have that you've come up to? And if the client's like, no, I absolutely know it's the Illuminati. I absolutely know they're going to come get me, and that you know I'm really scared about that. Then you know, and you go back and forth about that, and you keep asking questions, and it's you know pretty firm in there. Uh, if you know solution focused or motivational interviewing, those those kinds of techniques can help. But but even if they're staunch believers in you know, these kinds of things like the aliens are going to get us or, you know, FEMA is going to put me in a death camp or something. It doesn't really matter that they believe it, even if you don't believe it to be true. It, it just matters how it's affecting them. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that terrify us, right? We, you know, all of us are going to die, right? Presumably. And many of us are terrified of that fact. And, you wouldn't tell someone that they're delusional for believing they're going to die, right? Um, it's a rational belief. So the conversation in those situations, you won't try to confront the belief. You'll just say like, well, what do you think about it? You know, what does that mean? So, so if the Illuminati belief is, is totally uh, um, firm, then you, you just explore. It's like, so, okay, I get it. The Illuminati, the Illuminati is going to get you. 
And what does that mean for your life then? You know, is there anything you can do about it? Um, you know, um, what, what do you want to do? Do you want to think about it all the time? Do you want to be trapped in the anxiety or do you want to do something or do you want to, um, you know, to some extent, any kind of worry like that, you just have to grieve the loss of not having the worry, right? It's like, okay, well, now that that's a reality, how do you want to live your life? You know, the, if the Illuminati is going to get you next year, how do you want to live this next year? <laughs> you know, or if the Illuminati is going to get you eventually, how do you want to live your life until the Illuminati does get you? Or whatever, you know, it, there's so many different kinds of conversations you can have that have nothing to do with you telling them that they're stupid for having their beliefs, you know? Um, so again, you really just have to think about what your role is. Um, it, and, and, if they, and if they're talking about the Illuminati all the time, but they're coming into you because they want to quit smoking, um, just as an example, or a couple comes to you to work on their marriage and they both totally believe in the Illuminati or they both totally believe in, you know, government cover-ups or aliens or whatever, um, and they actually bond over those things, then you wouldn't actually bother with it at all. In fact, it would be counterproductive given your role and given the goals of the therapy. It's not your job. And what do you know, really? And, you know, cultural beliefs are real and clients have the autonomy to believe whatever they want to believe. Even if, even if you think it's harmful, even if you, so even if you think a belief of theirs is harmful, that is up to them. Clients have autonomy. You know, I don't know exactly what your, uh, you know, your clinic is doing, but from the sound of it, it sounds like just a regular clinic or agency in which clients are, have medical coupons or whatever, and they're coming in for, you know, this or that. And, you know, you're a, you're a healer, you're a helper, and you're on their side. And if they, you know... Another way of approaching this is, is you just be like, you know what, I, I hear you talk about your, the conspiracies, I hear you talk about aliens or whatever it is, and I hear you talk about, you know, demonic possessions, and I just have to say I don't see the world that way. I'm not saying you're right and I'm wrong, I'm, I'm just saying that that's just not how I see the world. And I just wanted to know if you wanted to have conversations about that. Do you want to talk about that or not? Do you, you know, um, or... Another way of approaching it is, so I hear you talking a lot about aliens and demons and Obama's going to get you and, you know, I hear you talking a lot about that. And I totally value that, you know, that's how you see the world. And, you know, a lot of people see the world that way. I just wanted to know if you wanted to talk about that or not. Do you want to talk about that with me? And if they're like, no, I don't want to talk about that with you. And they're like, okay. You know, and then you might a while later say, hey, you know, do you want to talk about that again? <laughs> you know, but, you know, just, just ask them, just say, hey. You know, just be respectful and give it, it's up to them. And if they don't want to talk about it, then, then you know, you don't talk about it. I find that a lot of agencies have this culture that it's kind of like us versus them. It's like therapists versus clients. And, it, you know, it shouldn't be that way, right? Um, you just, just put it up to class. or And again, if you really wanted to, just self-disclose. Just be like, you know what? I have to tell you, pretty much all of the way you see the world is totally different than the way I do. And I have to, I have to be honest. I think that people who think that aliens and reptiles live among us, I have to say, I, I think that they have it wrong. And I, it almost makes me laugh the way that people think that way. I, you know, I hate to say that, but you know, I'm just, I'm just going to come clean and tell you that. Um, and I just have to tell you that because I just have to. I feel like you just should know. And you know, if you want to have a conversations about that with me, I'd love to. I, I like you and. I respect you, but I just feel like I have to get that off my chest. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. Um, now, you asked about, well, don't I have a responsibility if they're delusional? You know, if there's a real mental issue, issue here, you know, don't I have a responsibility? Well, um, you know, depending on our definitions, it's really hard to differentiate between some forms of quote-unquote mental illness, you know, delusions, schizophrenia, and, and quote-unquote normal cultural beliefs. There's been an ongoing debate about this in our field for you know, several um, uh, decades, and, it, and it's always worthy of contemplation. Um, but you know, if you have experience with schizophrenia and other psychotic uh, issues, I, I feel like it's pretty easy to tell the difference between someone who's genuinely delusional and someone who just has 
who's been listening to a lot of Alex Jones. You know what I mean? There, there's a pretty big difference between that. Um, now, there's a spectrum of people who are really attracted to these kind of fantastical beliefs. There, there's been psychological studies that um, try to look at the personality types of people who, and, and the childhood histories of people who are um, open or are attracted to these um, fringe ideas about how the world works. So, so there's that, you know, but we don't call that mental illness. We would just call that personality. And um, so there's that. But, you know, even if they did have a kind of very specific delusion and, you know, nine out of 10 clinical assessors would, would call that a delusion independent of any kind of cultural element, even if that was true, if the client isn't asking for help with that, then it's not, it's not your job to force help on people. Um, you know, uh, some, um, some venues, some workplaces, if someone is completely off the hook and highly symptomatic in bipolar or, or schizophrenia or something, then it is kind of your role to force help on them. But it doesn't sound like you're at that kind of place. So um, I would avoid that kind of thinking. You know, let's just look at it from another, another angle. Imagine one of your clients got in a car accident and his entire family was killed, his wife, his children. And naturally afterwards, he was suffering from tremendous grief and shame and guilt and anger and depression. And, and let's just say he's an atheist and was like you, just super scientific. But over time, through his exploration and, and through him, um, you know, searching for answers as to why the universe took away his family like that, he started talking with you in, in session, you know, six months, 12 months later, he's like, you know what, I, I really feel like I was wrong about atheism. And I've been listening to this, this guy on the radio and, you know, he's making some really, really great arguments about how there are aliens. There are these reptile people who live among us. And many of these reptile people are actually really nice to humans. And, and they actually know how to raise people from the dead. If, if we are nice to them and, and, we, and we allow them to live on the planet, then they can save our... Um, our loved ones, or or they might even have technologies to actually save people before they die, to, to be able to take their their um, minds, their consciousness, and put them into a computer. And so, um, this guy on the radio is talking about how my my wife and my kids might actually still be alive on a computer on an alien spaceship. So, if you heard them say this, of course, this would be completely counter to your belief system, and you you would likely have a part of you of you that would really judge that as, as really stupid thinking, right? Well, what would you do? Well, for me, if you were my supervisor, I'd really hope that you'd be cool with it. <laughs> because if you just look at the elements of it, there there's nothing wrong with him believing in this belief. In fact, it, it might even be helping him. And it's his journey that he's going on. You know, maybe in 10 years, he won't believe that anymore. But this is where his journey has taken him. And it, to some extent, you could imagine that being justified, right? And when you can be cool with people saying things like this, when it, when it doesn't phase you at all, then you know you've become a true therapist, in my opinion. It might take a long time. It took me a while. It took me a while to, to do this. It, I had to really shift my paradigm. When I first started out as a therapist, it was really hard for me to listen to people with different worldviews than me. I would really just be like, no, 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 no. But over time, and I'm still not <laughs> perfect at this at all, but I find it much easier now, 20 some odd years into this profession than I did in the beginning. And it's, it's liberating. And I talk with supervisees about this all the time, and I find that um, I get a glazed look in their eye because they're just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I, I feel like it's hard to explain what I'm talking about. It's like, all I can tell people is that the the paradigm shift when I had it over time, I really truly believe that I know nothing. And 
I, my ego, I just put it aside. When, when someone's telling about me about their life, I just, it's liberating. It's, it feels good to put my ego aside. It's, um, it gives me pleasure <laughs> to shelve my own belief system, you know, just be like, well, what do I know? And what, why do I care? It, it, it's such a freedom, you know, cause, cause when you have a, a firm, especially if you're like, you know, patron Leanna, when, when you have like a pretty firm worldview and you, and you, you have this pretty firm line between what is right and what is wrong. And, and I actually have that too. Um, but when I interact with clients and I hold on to that, part of my ego, it, it, there's a lot of labor that goes into me actually trying to suppress that or deal with it or, you know, cope with it or something. Whereas if I put all that aside and I just look at the fundamentals of what someone is trying to tell me, this man is telling me that he has found a belief system that gives him hope that he might be reconnected with his family. And he's smiling again. And He's happy and he's sad that his family is gone, but he wonders if he might see them again and and he wonders if he can actually even communicate with them now. And he's not, you know, giving his entire estate over to the reptile people or to Alex Jones or something, but he is, he's starting to feel better. And what do I care what belief he has? I mean, the, you know, imagine if he was an atheist or forget about the atheist. Imagine if he was Catholic to begin with, and he turned to the church for help, and the church told him that his family was in heaven, smiling down on him. How would you feel about that? I mean, that's much more mainstream magical belief, but um, same, you know, if someone believes in the Illuminati or the reptile people or Jesus or, you know, whatever, it's all belief system, and, and it has to be looked at uh, through that lens. Having said that, there are absolutely situations where someone will have a belief system that will b- impact the goal and your role as a therapist, and you know you explore it. But again, it's from a curious place. Okay, hope that answers your question. Let me know if it does or it doesn't. Let's go on to another email. Okay, this email is from an anonymous patron. They write, "Hi Kirk, I have an issue with my boyfriend." We have been together for around a year, and we rarely have full-on sexual intercourse. We rarely have full-on sexual or intercourse. We have second base stuff, but not the sexual intercourse because my boyfriend is afraid of pregnancy despite us using two birth control methods. He also has a shameful attitude toward his sexuality. He was a virgin before we met. He's attracted to me because he has no problem responding to my touch, but he stops himself. I've tried to talk to him about this, but he shuts down and dismisses it. He claims that sex is not important in relationships. Is there anything I can do? We are only in our early 20s. I like sex, but it feels so frustrating that I can't really get much. Is there any way I can get through to him? I'm afraid I will eventually get sick of this and throw the relationship away. I love him a lot, but I need more intimacy. Uh, end of email. Yeah, these are good questions. Sexuality, the, the thing I'll say is up front is sexuality is extremely complicated. There are a lot of different reasons as to why something like this would happen. Um, but what I really want you to do is actually find a couples therapist who specializes in sexual issues and talk with them. Um, the The severity or the the complexity of the issue and the way you're presenting it. I'm imagining you're going to need a specialist couples therapist to help you navigate this, to guide you, to support the two of you and to facilitate conversations and maybe have individual conversations with each of you about it. But in general, there are many different possible issues that you could be facing. I mean, the first one is, is he might just not be into sex. There, there are plenty of people on the planet, including men, who just don't like sex. They like intimacy, they like relationships, they might like second base stuff, but they don't like intercourse. It's just not for them. They call them, um, sometimes they're called asexual people, sometimes just, it's just their preference, you know. We, we, we tend to see um, people like this as being pathological in our society, but 
uh, again, particularly men. But, um, you know, it's, it's just a decision. Some people like donuts and some people don't. Some people like um, hamburgers and some people don't. Some people like intercourse and some people don't. So it's, you know, that's the first thing I'll say. Yeah, but if it is some kind of issue, it could be past abuse, obviously, sexual abuse. He could have erectile issues, even though at times he appears to not. He could have premature ejaculation issues and shame around that. He could just have shame in general about the way that he looks or what happens to him or something. He could have a form of OCD where he doesn't want to um, contaminate himself or something, or or he might have a, an obsession or a compulsion around pregnancy. He, you know, he might be obsessing on that. He might have anxiety in general. He might have PTSD uh, that gets triggered by intercourse somehow. Um, he might have an actual medical condition that he either suspects or knows about that has to do with his penis that he doesn't want to talk about. He could he could have an STD even though he's never had sex before. He could have an STD and he is ashamed of it and doesn't want to you know, give it to you. And, you know, there's just a lot of different possibilities that I've heard about that um, could be. If I was to take an educated guess as to the highest likelihood is that he has, for whatever reason, some kind of shame and some kind of anxiety around intercourse. And, um, you know, the, the other possibility, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, is that some people don't want to have sex until they're, for religious reasons or just other reasons, they don't want to have a sex until the relationship, uh, for, you know, progresses. Sometimes people want to wait years before they have intercourse just because it's just how they are. They just, you know what, let's do second base stuff and let's, um, and, and let's hold off on the intercourse because intercourse is for babies and, and that's later on. So it, he could be, uh, he could have, it could be a religious or a spiritual belief or just a general belief that he has about the way he likes to have relationships. And he's having a hard time talking about that. Um, so there's all that. Uh, and again, I really highly recommend that you talk with a couples therapist who specializes in sexuality. Um, they, they're, it's sort of a rare speci- specialty, but most couples therapists, I would imagine, would be able to talk about that with you. And having said all that, none of this, you know, everything I've been saying has been focused on him. You have, you know, needs too. And you have a a vision as to how you would like your romantic relationships to go. And so, you know, really pay attention to that. You deserve to have the relationship you want and, you know, really value that. Now, all relationships have some degree of sacrifice in order to make it work. So maybe this is that one one of the things that you have to sacrifice in terms of your preferences. But at the same time, you know, really value that you have the, uh, I don't want to say right, but you have um, value. And if your needs aren't being met, then at the very least, you have the right to say like, hey, you know, I, I think we should go to a therapist and talk about this because I you know, like you, and I really want to make this work. And I want to see if we can both get our needs met in this way. Um, You deserve to have that. So, you know, all right, let's read another email. Actually, no, let's take a break. And when we get back, we'll we'll read more patron emails. All right, we're back from the break. If you haven't already become a patron of the podcast, do so now. You might have to go to your computer. You can also sign up on your phone, but, you know, do those technical things to go to patreon.com and become a patron of the podcast. It's really by far the best way you can express your love for this podcast. If you love the podcast, do it now. (laughs) If you, you know, barely like this podcast, then maybe that's not for you. Uh, Anyway, uh, this is an email from an anonymous person. writes in, I had my first panic attack today. I did not realize it was a panic attack at first. I thought I was having a stroke. I didn't feel any pain or nausea, but a kind of general numbness and and dizziness, rapid increase in heart rate, and a sense of dread. I genuinely thought I might die. I was taken to a hospital. I had several tests done, and I was told that I was in good health. 
It took some time for me to accept this. The episode probably lasted for about an hour and a half with varying levels of intensity. I now feel better, but I'm still anxious, confused, and somewhat ashamed. Why did this happen? I know this is really hard to answer, but although I had some anxiety, it really didn't seem like enough anxiety to bring on a panic attack. I've always been paranoid about having a stroke for some reason, even though I'm generally in good health. How likely is this generally to happen again, in your opinion? End of email. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that uh, this is nothing to be ashamed of. Panic attacks are extremely common. I've had panic attacks, and I am not ashamed of it. <laughs> I don't have any problem talking about it. Uh, I've talked with many people about it. It's it's not a weakness. It's just a normal biological variant that happens to many, many, many people. Something like a third of Americans at some point will be diagnosable with a, an anxiety disorder and and often you know those anxiety disorders involve panic so um so there's that and the second thing i'll say is that i'm really sorry that this happened to you it's really horrible panic attacks are no fucking joke they are awful take it from me um you know when when you hear about the symptoms you're like ah, it doesn't sound so bad hour and a half of rapid heart rate and having a sense of dread that does not encapsulate how horrible a, a full-blown panic attack is, especially untreated when you're really just left to your own devices to try to figure out what's happening to you. Like the first number of panic attacks I had in my early 20s. I, you know, it's one, it's one thing to think you're going to die. It's another thing to think that you, you're dying in the worst way possible and you have no idea why you feel that way. It's, it is, it is, this acute anxiety that is that comes on so strong and is so all-encompassing it is ridiculous it is awful um so i you know i get it it's awful now you ask a question why did it happen there's no way to know why why it happened there's no way to know the answer to that we just don't have the technologies to answer that question we we don't understand anything really about the brain and let alone panic attacks. Um, you know, there are certain sort of things we can say globally involving fear centers, the amygdala, fight or flight, adrenaline, um, misfiring the brain or something like that. But to truly answer that question is um, far from our current technologies. And I'm guessing in our lifetimes, we won't be able to really answer those questions. Um, but we might have some guesses based on good evidence, good guesses. Some people just randomly have panic attacks seemingly, um, even later in life. I, I know people who, the age of 45, never had a panic attack, and then one day, boom, huge panic attack. Um, the other thing is, is that it's impossible to know if it was actually a panic attack. You know, when you had, so you had an experience and you can describe it, and you went to physicians and the physicians said there was nothing wrong with you. Well, the best guess is, is you had a panic attack, but there's literally no way of knowing if you didn't actually have a little stroke <laughs> like, or um, some other biological process. Because not only do we not understand the brain, but we don't really understand the overall nervous system, and we definitely don't understand the body overall very well. We understand a lot of things about it for sure, but um, there's, you know, we don't have like a, like a, tricorder scanner on Star Trek that can instantly diagnose everything about your body. It, it's, it, you know, you go to the physicians, they, they run some tests and they're like, uh, most likely this was a panic attack. You know, it's most likely this guy didn't actually suffer from an actual physical issue. Um, so, you know, there's all that having said that from your description. Yeah. It sounds like a classic panic attack. So I, I would, I would definitely put my money on that. So again, it could be that it's a one-time thing and it was a random thing and you just, you know, something, your body conspired and you just had this one lifetime event where you just had this panic attack. Totally possible. Um, another possibility is that it was a buildup of stress. Um, you, I didn't read your whole email, but in the rest of your email that I didn't read, you talked about, you know, you're going through some stress and you, and you said to yourself, you, you said in your email, you know, I was going through some stress, but I didn't think that much stress. Well, the thing about stress is you don't really notice it. I've never heard someone say to me, um, 
yeah, I was going through some stress, but, um, and it totally made sense that that happened. You know, people will say like, um, yeah, the doctors told me that this was brought on by stress, but I didn't really feel like I was going through stress. Your body doesn't necessarily tell you when you are stressing the fuck out. (laughs) Um, You know, there are definitely stresses that you'll feel like fight or flight adrenaline responses, but there's some, there's some buildup of stress, you know, kind of a low hum of stress that'll slowly build in your body and your heart rate is racing and adrenaline's, you know, kind of seeping in there and, you know, things are happening in your body and you just don't really, you just don't really notice it, particularly if um, you're not used to paying attention to that kind of thing. Anyway, and, and really I find mainstream Americans are, they, they feel like it's complete. They feel they're so stressed out all the time that they feel like it's normal. So when you ask them, are you stressed out? They're like, nope, totally normal. But what is actually true is they're, they're quite stressed, but they're quite stressed all the time. And so it feels normal to them. <laughs> like they've, they very rarely actually relax because they're working so hard all the time, you know? Anyway, number three, another possibility is that you have some sort of deep trauma and that was triggered. And you, whether it be, you know, specific to PTSD or just some trauma reaction, it's possible that through the process and the stress that you're going through, that there was some neurologically, you know, wired trauma experience that you had been through that was, that was touched on and and you had a panic attack. Uh, Number four, another possibility that as to why you had a panic attack is that there was actually some kind of physical thing that was happening. When you have, you can actually induce a panic attack on a lot of people if you just give them a, uh, an excess of carbon dioxide, I think. Um, I can't remember how it is, but there's some kind of way that you can actually cause panic attacks in people. There's, there's you know, panic attacks are to some extent kind of wired into us that go back probably to reptiles, you know, it's, it's a, and it's a, it's an adaptive mechanism that kicks in, you know, if, if we're trapped or something, it, it makes sense that we would just flip the fuck out and try to free ourselves when, you know, if, if we're, if we're trapped in a hole or someone's holding us down or it, you know, we don't need our higher mind. We need to, we need to feel the dread and we need to freak out and we need to run, you know? And, and so I think that's why the panic attack mechanism is in us and probably a lot of other animals. And so it's possible that some sort of biological trigger happened um, to you. Maybe you weren't breathing quite right or um, something you ate. It's it, 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 again, no way of knowing that, but seems like another hypothesis. And number f- and number five, which I think is probably the most likely answer, is that you're, you you tell me that you have a phobia about strokes. Well, that implies that you have some kind of level of anxiety, and it's possible that your phobia around stroke having a stroke has progressed to the point where you ended up having a panic attack. Anxi- anxiety that is left unchecked tends to grow and grow and grow. And so it's possible that your anxiety about having a stroke may have even started from some other kind of anxiety, which I'm guessing is true, and it slowly grew and then add that stress and blah, blah, blah. And then, and I'm guessing what happened to you, which is common for a lot of people, is you're kind of primed to have a panic attack about a stroke because you're already kind of worried about a stroke. You think about it a lot. You, you know, you're thinking, oh my God, am I having a stroke right now? Or what, you know, what if, what happens if I have a stroke? And then you, you, you feel a, a kind of a sensation, maybe some kind of stress is triggering some slight physical sensation, you know, some, some little tingling of some kind. And then your brain says, oh my God, stroke. And then boom, off to the races, amygdala, you know, total panic attack. And um, that's a very common scenario. Now, what happens after having a panic, panic attack or during is you're actually traumatized by the event, which makes sense, right? It's a terrifying event. And everything that is associated with that event becomes encoded in your brain as associated with this trauma and something to be avoided. You know, we we evolved a post-traumatic stress reaction that makes sense, right? So if if we get attacked by a saber-toothed tiger and uh, we our brain really pays attention to that trauma and we survive it, our brain really pays attention to that trauma. The smell in the air, 
the sound that the tiger made as it snuck up on us, the, um, you know, the way the tiger looked, um, where you were, all of that gets encoded. The brain doesn't know what to encode as part of the actual danger. It just, it just takes the entire event, encodes it in your brain and says, avoid all of these things. Avoid the tiger, avoid the smell, avoid the way the sounds you heard, everything. Everything's beca- everything becomes associated. So when someone is sexually abused, for example, all of it gets encoded. The smells, the sex, um, you know, just everything and anything that remi- any one of those elements that uh, you experience later on will, will trigger that, that original feeling of terror. Well, when you have anything that resembles this panic attack, which believe me, there's a lot of different things that will remind you of this, your brain will think, oh my God, I'm heading into danger again, and you'll have another panic attack, or you'll be at risk of having a panic attack, or at the very least, you'll, you'll have a spike in distress. And the and very important thing is that you need to get a handle of this. You need to go to a therapist. You need to talk with a panic specialist. Um, you need to educate yourself on panic because that, that's for me that's how I got I got rid of my own panic myself I educated myself on panic um, you know I went to graduate school and became a therapist and learned about panic and other anxieties and pretty much instantly cured myself of, of my anxiety disorders because when you know what's actually happening it really helps because as you're entering the panic attack you're like if, if you the thing is is you have to drill it into your head so it becomes automatic thinking once the panic attack sets in if you just tell yourself casually ah, the next time I have a panic attack I'll just reassure myself well when you actually have a panic attack you'll lose the ability to remember things and so you won't remember that but if you just drill it into your head like this is what panic attacks are these are the physiological reasons this is this is this sensation it'll, you know, you just have to wait for it to go away. It's just a, it's just a cloud that comes and the cloud that goes, it's just a wave of anxiety. Here are the things I need to do. I need to breathe. I need to relax my muscles. I need to stop. For me, what I did was I just told when, when a panic attack began for me, I sat down, I closed my eyes. I focused on my breathing. I didn't feel good. I was terrified. I had, you know, the dread and all that kind of stuff. But I just sat down and I closed my eyes and I just told myself, as I told myself thousands of times while I wasn't having a panic attack, this is why it was so easy for me to recall when my brain wasn't working well during a panic attack, that I was like, everything's fine. The wave of anxiety will come and it will go. It will pass. Because that's one of the things about panic attacks that's terrifying is, for many people, is, well, is this ever going to end or is it just going to get worse and worse and worse until my brain explodes? That that's what I used to think. I used to think like, if I, if not, if I'm not super hyper hyper vigilant about avoiding the triggers, then my brain's going to explode, you know, cause you just, it just feels that way. But if you just sit down and you're like, I'm not, I can't be harmed. There's, there's no harm that can come from me from this. And I know that cause I've read all the material and I've looked at the research. I know the signs and everything's fine. I just need to, sit here and wait and everything will be fine. It won't, for about two minutes, it's not going to feel good. And, but, you know, just wait. And then as soon as it, and then it peaks and then it starts to ramp down, you're like, okay, it's coming down and it'll be in five minutes. It'll be completely gone. You just tell yourself that. Um, I would also uh, uh, consider talking with a psychiatrist about getting some benzos. Uh, People who suffer from panic, There is nothing wrong with taking a Xanax when you are actually headed into a panic attack. Um, It takes 20 to 30 minutes for a benzo to kick in, but sometimes it helps to have that on hand. What I recommend people do is, you know, upon consulting with a medical professional, just get like three pills. You don't need a whole bottle full. You You just need a few, maybe a couple, because one in all likelihood, just having the pills nearby will help you to feel better because you're like, well, if worse comes, you know, if it gets really bad, like I have another hour and a half one, I'll just pop one of these pills because if you take a Xanax, it'll go away, um, believe me. So, um, uh, or at least, you know, that's what people report. I've, I've actually never had to take a um, Benzo to help me with um, panic. I've taken Benzos to help me with 
getting through a medical procedure, that really helped. <laughs> um, um, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of really wonderful um, uses for benzos. Uh, I've only used uh, Xanax and Valium, I don't know, two or three times, but the times I've used it, man, did it, did it help? <laughs> so, um, don't be afraid to, you know, get a couple of those. Um, so again, therapist, education, psychiatrist, relaxation skills, um, and keep talking about it, you know, keep, keep talking about it. And in your email, you also were worried because you, 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 I think in your email, you're talking about how you had a pa panic attack while you were trying to get a job, I think. And you think like maybe you, the panic attack might have made everyone judge you badly. Um, so if you want, don't be afraid to just um, educate yourself, you know, get rid of the shame and go up to them and just be like, look, I'm really sorry what happened the other day. I don't know what happened, but I think I had my very first panic attack and, um, you know, I'm hitting it hard with therapy and everything. And, um, you know, I don't know, it's sort of weird. It's just a weird event. I had a panic. Don't be ashamed. It's, there is nothing wrong with it. I, I'm going to take a guess and say that at least one of the people you tell at this venue will be like, oh my God, I had a panic attack once too, you know, that, so, you know, it's, it's highly prevalent. At least anxiety is, is very prevalent. So, um, that's what I recommend you do there. All right, let's read another email. Okay, this email is from Patron Robert. Patron Robert writes, Hey Kirk, I was listening to your top 10 neglected areas in psychotherapy episode. You mentioned that therapists don't use research enough or they don't know how to use research correctly. An interesting podcast would be to discuss ways that therapists could use research and empirical data. You had mentioned that a professor you have... No, you mentioned that since you're a professor, you have access to research through your university. However, most therapists will not have access to that information. What are good places to go to get that information and now to use and how to use it properly? I currently subscribe to Clinical Psychological Science Journal. End of email. Yeah, I commend you for asking this and I commend you for actually subscribing to a journal. Um, it's actually uh, not that expensive to get access to like thousands of journals in psychology. For example, if you're a member of the American Psychological Association, you only have to pay $139 per year to get access to the PsychNet, which um, probably gives you access to you know everything that you would ever want. Um, so, you know, if, if, if you're a part of a professional organization, which we all should be to support our lobbyists working hard for our political interests, um, then I'm guessing that for a small fee, you know, hundred, two hundred dollars $200, something, you get, you get access. And it might sound like a lot, but I think it's really necessary if you want to stay up to date. Um, it, I can't tell you, I mean, I couldn't do this podcast if I didn't have access to those things. And if I wasn't a professor, I would gladly pay that fee because whenever I'm doing an episode on a topic, I can very quickly Google some, or, you know, search for something in the psych info or Abesco or PsychNet database and, and instantly get access to um, cutting edge information that I'm here to tell you is not available on the internet. When I, I, you know, I've prepared for hundreds of episodes on hundreds of different topics. And one of the things you, that I quickly learned early on was that if you just Google uh, a question, you know, like um, complex PTSD, how do you treat it or something like it becomes uh, very clear that the information that is available on the internet is crap compared to the internet compared to the information you can get from actual research journal articles which makes sense of course when people publish things in peer reviewed journals they will it's you know 10 page long journal article 5 pages long there are there are people who will spend 3 years working on that one article trying to get it publishable they'll they, they be people in preparation for these ten page articles in these journal these journals will spend twenty years of their life uh, working hard to become expert enough in that area so that they can get money to to do the research and 
clout enough at their university and time, and then they finally get the research funded, and then they finally get the research assistance and everything in line, and they you know, work out all the IRB stuff and they finally get that and then they write up, write it up and then they finally, you know, submit it and they, they get it returned back to them for edits and blah, blah, blah. You know, the amount of rigor that goes into the, to many of these journals. Now there, there are journals out there that are crap and that don't have a very good process and they, they'll put anything in it. So you have to be careful, but well, the respected journals really put their authors and their s- submitters through the ringer before they, they'll, they'll publish something. And there's pros and cons to that. But one of the pros is that you can pretty much guarantee that if it's a respectable journal, that the, it, this is the best piece that will ever be written about this topic at that, at that time. Uh, the lit reviews are amazing. I, I read journal article lit reviews for, for, to prepare for probably every uh, episode that I make of this podcast because it these they in a you know one or two pages maybe five paragraphs they have to summarize everything that's ever been said about a particular topic (laughs) and that really makes it easy right to it's like oh thank you for thank you for because the other thing is is whenever you do research and then whenever you do uh you know report reporting on data in a particular area like complex ptsd then you as a researcher or your team has to read, you know, every or virtually every important study that has ever been done. And you have to read the entire thing and you have to know it frontward, frontwards and backwards. I mean, when I did my dissertation on difficult clinical moments, I basically had memorized every single journal article that had ever been written. I had them, I had the authors memorized, I had the years memorized, I had their statistical findings memorized. I, I had it, you know, just because that's just the nature of, you know, you spend three years on a topic, you, you become extremely knowledgeable of that one tiny little slice of, of the field. And so by the time you write your lit review and summarize everything, it becomes extremely, you can just, people can just write the lit review without even thinking about it because they're so familiar with the literature anyway. So it's very valuable and worth the price. If you don't want to do that and you want to spend less money, another option is to look toward professional organizations and their magazines. Like the APA Monitor, for example, is a magazine put up by the American Psychological Association. And they have research riddled throughout it. And they summarize research very quickly and you know, they'll have in-depth articles on this and that. And so the APA Monitor can be a good way to stay up to date on research for sure. Or, the, or Family Therapy Magazine or Psychotherapy Networker, for example. Um, I've had subscription to all, subscriptions to all those uh, uh, things, and um, that can be pretty good too. Um, there's also the library. You can just go to the public library, and I'm, I'm guessing they have access to these kinds of things. You could check them out, or um, I wonder if they even have uh, access to um, psychology journal articles on their computers. I don't know. Um, now, you asked, how do we use research? Well, there's a, there's many different ways to become good at using research. One is to take courses on research. Um Research is quite complicated, and, and if you take, uh, you know, a few courses on how to do research, how to read research, and um, all that kind of stuff, then it it becomes a lot easier. That's what I did when when I got my doctorate. They force you to take classes on research, and they force you to do research yourself. And if and by the end of if it's one thing I learned from my doctorate, it it was research. It was how to do it, how to design it, how to evaluate it, how to read it, how to summarize it, how to skim it fast, how to understand it, everything. Like I, you know, the amount of learning I did in my doctorate regarding research was phenomenal. Um, Master's degrees typically don't have a lot of research education, whereas doctorate degrees do. So, but short of that, I guess you could just take courses on research. You could audit courses or something. I don't know. Um, but really, the main thing is is you just need to read as many journal articles as possible. Um, when I was in my master's degree, I didn't really, I wasn't really required to read a lot of journal articles. But when I got my doctorate, I read so many journal articles for various different reasons, and 
it it it's just a f- it's a form of writing and a format that once you read your 10,000th journal article you can absorb a journal article very quickly but the first thousand journal articles I read, it takes me a while to understand what they're talking about, you know? Like, I'd read it, and I'd sort of stare at it, and it's like, oh, they're speaking English, but I really don't understand what they're saying, you know? But over time, you just keep reading it, you keep reading it, and it's like, you know, understand, you start to understand what they're saying. So if you're one of those people that hasn't read a lot of journal articles, a lot of research um, literature, and it's sort of frustrating to you because you feel like you don't really understand what they're saying. Just keep reading it, you know, just keep at it. Try to understand it. Over time, you'll, you just, it just practice makes perfect. Um, the other uh, thing you can do is when you actually do read the articles is read the lit reviews, which is usually the first section uh, after the abstract. And the um, lit reviews are basically often they're talking about other journal articles, right? So when you read and then you, and then go to those journal articles that they're actually referencing and see, and see how they are summarizing them. Sometimes they summarize it in one sentence, you know? So that can be another way to understand research. Um, Also read books that talk about research. You know, my book, not to plug it, but um, multi-role clinical supervision, I, I have, I, I reference so many different research studies in that book. And, and when you read people, so in, and in that book, I'm trying to make it readable. I'm trying to make it um, concise and, and um, easy to read and, and, and impactful. I'm trying to make an argument in that book about supervision. And so when you read books that interweave research effectively and often, um, that kind of helps you to understand. And then especially if you go to those research articles and actually look them over and see like, oh, I see what I see why he went to that or article and I see why he pulled that piece out of it and that kind of thing. Um, like I said, get a doctorate. That'll, that'll help in terms of your ability to use research. Um, just browse for fun. You know, once you actually get access to journal articles and research, just, you know, just, just, Browse like you would on Google or something. Just click around, read, open up this and that, look at some abstracts. Again, the, the more contact you have, the better you'll understand it and the better you'll be able to use it. Um, the other thing you can do is start a podcast because about psychology because you'll need to read them. You'll have a, it'll be part of your job. So it's part of my job to browse psychology databases and find inf- interesting information and just that exposure helps, you know. But more specifically, you know, I think what you're asking is, as a therapist, how do you use, how do you use research when you have access to it? Well, let's say you're working with a client who suffers from complex PTSD, as I've been talking about. They had a history of childhood sexual abuse or physical abuse or something from their parents. And you, you know, you're, you think, you know, maybe this maybe this person has complex PTSD. Um, what is complex PTSD exactly? What does the research talk about it? How do you treat it? Well, so let's just walk ourselves through this. So um, I'm going to take a break here, and I'm going to I'm going to you know search for that in my um, Abesco. Okay, okay, that just took me 30 seconds, and I clicked on one of the very first things I saw, and it is a article from 2016 called. Critical Analysis of the Current Treatment Guidelines for Complex PTSD in Adults. So very recent, 2016, Critical Analysis of the Current Treatment Guidelines for Complex PTSD in Adults. Uh, It is written by, looks to be like 30 different um, researchers, and looks like they are all from different places. One of them is from... University of Washington here in Seattle. Who is that? Um, Lori Zollner. Lori, Dr. Lori Zollner is from University of Washington. So um, anyone else? Let's see. Yeah, it looks like that's it. But um, so people from uh, Germany, Georgia, Netherlands. So, you know, people all over the world, you know, uh, looks like some kind of task force of some kind. Uh, let's, let's look at this. 
uh, yeah, Complex Trauma Task Force of the International Society of Traumatic Stress Studies. So these people got together in 2012 and decided to work on treatment guidelines. So, so let's see what they say here. So right off the bat, they talk about the validity of the, of the complex PTSD construct. Is complex PTSD actually a thing? And it starts off by saying, complex PTSD has been hypothesized to occur after the experience of severe prolonged or repeated stressors and to be comprised of the classic PTSD symptoms as well as additional symptoms including disturbances of affect, self, and interpersonal relationships. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So one thing they say here is that when they look at all the research, when this task force, task force look at all the research, they found that there isn't necessarily a decided upon definition of complex PTSD. Also, they're saying that there, there seems to be a number of different roads to complex PTSD. So sometimes it's a history of childhood sex, sexual abuse. Um, sometimes it's uh, female veterans who go through war. Sometimes it's, you know, other things. So it, the, to say that there's only one way to treat complex PTSD is uh, limiting because there's there's different kinds of complex PTSD. It's a it's a kind of a broad diagnosis, and there's lots of different things. Also, they they provide uh, a summary of the treatment guidelines, which are um, let's see. According to the guidelines, psychotherapy should begin with a stabilization phase aimed at assuring the individual's safety by reducing self-regulation self problems and improving emotional, social, and psychological competencies. So phase one is like, make sure that they are um, stable and their life is going okay, you know, their basic needs and that their, their basic emotional functioning and social functioning are, um, you know, stable before you move on to phase two. This should then be followed by a phase focusing on the trauma and the processing of the trauma memories. Uh, a final integration phase consolidates treatment gains and helps the person adapt to current life circumstances. So when I read that, I'm like, okay, uh, phase one and two and three, I totally get, but phase two sounds extremely complicated. So let's look more into that. Actually, further on in the article, they talk about how the evidence seems to suggest that this phase one stabilization is not actually necessary. They say, in conclusion, the, ev the evidence does not currently support the recommendation for stabilization phase prior to providing trauma-focused treatment in persons with complex PTSD or related severe or complicated presentations of PTSD. So basically what they're saying in conclusion after looking at all the research is there's, there's, although stabilization is something you can do with people, you don't have to wait for that to complete before going into trauma-focused work. So that's, that's interesting. So, you know, when you read this, you're like, oh, okay, interesting. Now, if you were working with someone with complex PTSD, you wouldn't just go off of this article and go like, okay, now I know how to do, you know, now I know how to treat complex PTSD. So it'd be a, it'd be a, a combination of reading this article and, maybe a hundred other articles, talking with people about the research, reading, you know, it's just, it's a process. Anyway, what, let's see what else it says here. So here it says, participants, so this is, again, this is a meta study. So participants took part in a 24 weekly sessions uh, of either cognitive group psychotherapy with a specific focus on their traumatic events or counseling group psychotherapy without targeting the traumatic memories. The results of both treatments were compared with a weightless control group. Both treatments resulted in a significant reduction in PTSD severity compared to the weightless condition, with trauma-focused treatment reducing anger significantly more. Drop a, dropout rates between the trauma-focused and non-trauma-focused groups did not differ significantly. It was 23% and 14%. These studies suggest that trauma-focused treatment without a prior stabilization phase is feasible and clinically beneficial for complex PTSD, contrary to the recommendations of the guidelines. 
So that's interesting. And what I read from that is that group therapy is good for complex PTSD. And uh, 24 weeks seems to be a good length of time. And for this is for adults. And that dropout rates are about 20%. And that focusing on the trauma is not necessary to reduce, um, you know, so, you know, it says cognitive group therapy with specific focus on the traumatic events or counseling group, counseling group psychotherapy without targeting the traumatic memories. So group, group counseling that does not specifically target the traumatic memories. So it's just like general group counseling seems to be, is also effective at reducing PTSD symptoms, but not as good at reducing the anger symptoms um, that um, they see. I mean, so it does affect the anger somewhat, but not as well as the trauma focus group therapy for adults. So anyway, um, so that's just one example, one, one article, one topic. And, you know, I've learned a lot already just by glancing that over real quickly, and it didn't take me much time at all. So if you're a therapist, get access to these journal articles. It's, a, it's money well spent, uh, and you can spend, you know, spend half an hour a week kind of, you know, thinking about your clients or thinking about things you're interested in and search for it read five articles and if you do that every week five articles a week by you know a couple of years down the line you're you're going to be pretty comfortable and and you'll be able to do it really quick cuz that's the thing that I when I first started looking at journal articles I kind of just started from the beginning and just would read all the way through <laughs> and that takes a long time there's a way of skimming it and sort of looking for the information that will be the most useful to you there's a there's a pitfall to that, you know, some people will just skip to the conclusion and, and really kind of miss the whole point of the article. But, but anyway, um, so that is my recommendation, patron Robert on how people can use research for their work. Um, I don't know if I'm really answering your question though. So, so if I, so let's say I had a client who had complex PTSD and I, um, you know, search for this article, I look at it, and then I'm like, okay, um, the, the thing, because I'm not, I'm not doing group therapy, so I'd be like, okay, well, at least this article is talking about how you don't have to be afraid of moving into trauma work right away, because um, stabilization seems to not be necessary. You can absolutely work on that. So that'd be one interesting thing. If I had a client who was highly unstable and was wanting to work on their trauma, then I would know from this that in all likelihood, it's okay to move forward with trauma work while also talking about stabilization without having a firm completion of the stabilization phase. Um, I would also glean from these data that focusing on the trauma is one way to help reduce PTSD symptoms, but you can also reduce symptoms by providing general counseling. So, um, I mean, that's not exactly what this study found, but it th th there's an element of that, which is also kind of interesting when you think about it, you know? Um, because general counseling involves emotional regulation, venting your feelings, getting support, validation, relationship building, um, just a lot relation, you know, just having a, a good attachment with your therapist, you know, all those things are going to help you in general. And so, um, anyway, so that does it for that episode. I, I'm, I can't tell you how happy I am that I am able to scratch all of these emails off of my list. I've been doing it for a while now and I now have my, you know, I can't remember how many pages this was 80 pages or longer. Uh, particularly in the past, and it's now down to 15 pages. Can you believe that? That is, that feels, it just, I, I just get such a wonderful feeling. The problem now <laughs> is that the things that are left on this document are all deep dives. You know, self psychology for patron Kim, uh, Jody Arias, uh, someone named Zarna Joshi, Joshi, don't even know who that person is, Marilyn Monroe, narcissistic personality disorder, Thomas Saz. Michael Jackson, lifespan integration therapy. You know, there's just so many things that are going to require a full episode. So 
Um, but I'm going to look for, I look forward to doing deep dives. I, I'm going to be doing this podcast probably for another 30 years plus. So um, that's a lot of episodes that I have available, a lot of time I have available to me. And we will do it together. What do you say? All right. Well, that does it for that episode. Thanks for joining me. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really do. Thank you.